You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. We are moving now into perhaps a period of history that's more familiar with you, a little bit, at least in the books, where the book we're still way ahead of ourselves in the syllabus, but we will eventually catch up. We will eventually catch up. But we're looking at uh, chapter 19, 2021 for tonight. So we begin with the the good doctor uh, Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas. who, to a large degree, provides the theological, intellectual lift to the Roman Catholic Church. Comes from the good Dr. Aquinas. So what do we, let's, let's talk positively, we can run him down later, but uh, let's uh, talk positively first, so, um, or maybe even biographically. What do, we, what do we know biographically about him? Then we'll talk positively about him, and then we will critique him. And honestly, I don't know whether we'll ever see him again. That remains undecided. It's decided for sure because he's in one of two places, <laughs> but I don't know where it is. But anyway, let's let's talk biographically. What do we know biographically about Thomas Aquinas? Born in 1225 to an Italian aristocrat. Okay, born to an Italian aristocrat. Okay, so what does that say about his upbringing? Privileged. Privileged, and privileged in that time period, well, probably every time period, includes education, the finest education. Okay, how did he do in school? Real good, (laughs) real good, yes. His family kidnapped him, yes, wasn't that interesting? Why did they kidnap him? He wanted to be a priest. And, in a, and the aristocratic family wanted him to do what? Not be a priest. Yeah, they yeah they wanted him to renounce his vows. They wanted him to be, you know, he's the the heir apparent of the family fortune. They wanted him to do those kinds of things that aristocrats do. And so they kidnapped him for a couple of years, wasn't it? How did he get out? His sisters had mercy on him and and uh, helped him escape. Isn't that right? Did they lower him in a bucket over the wall? Okay, in a basket? That's uh, reminiscent of the Apostle Paul in Damascus, huh? Kind of interesting. So, yeah, that's kind of a wild upbringing. Anything else that we know about him? There you go. Well said. I love it. Thank you for that historical correction. Yeah, so Cologne Florence was an anachronism. Okay, good. That's what I like, a close and careful reader. I'm sure the rest of you researched that and knew that, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, good. We have a historian in our midst. Okay, anything else you know about him? He was introduced to Aristotle. Yes, that's right. And Aristotle had a large influence on him, right? Who is Aristotle's teacher? Plato. That's right. Plato and then Aristotle. So these are the two great minds of Greek philosophy. Yes. Well said. Yes. Yes. That is well said. So his fine education introduced him to the philosophy of the Greek philosophy and Aristotle in particular. Yep. That's right. Yes. So that was a pretty interesting little footnote there, wasn't it? Where was that footnote? Um, 136. Yeah, that's right. So that came from his debates with John Duns Scotus, huh? The invention of the word dunce. What a legacy, legacy, huh? Yeah, no kidding. Wasn't it interesting that he was called a dumb ox by his fellow students. That's sort of interesting, huh? Because of a quiet personal demeanor and considerable 
physical dimensions. That is a very kind and generous way to say a man who is severely overweight. Okay? So, uh, he was not going to be captain of the Cologne football team. He was a pure academic, for sure. Yep. What do you think his IQ might have been? Really high. <laughs> really high. He was absolutely brilliant. I think the author says, perhaps the most brilliant since origin. Didn't I read that? I didn't write it down, so I can't take you to it, but I believe I read that. Okay, anything else you know about him? Just biographically? Yes! Didn't that boggle your mind? I, I'm, I challenge the whole idea of multitasking as a general rule. I don't think most people can multitask. Evidently, this man really could multitask in a true sense, dictating several books simultaneously. And not comic books. <laughs> Serious stuff. Yep. That's right. Very good. What is he most known for? What, in terms of his writings that he left behind? Obviously, if he's keeping several secretaries busy constantly, then his literary output was prodigious. But he is known in particular for two books. Yeah, Summa Against the Gentiles and the Summa Theologica. And Summa Theologica is probably, at least at this point, his most well-known. What was the Summa Theologica? Which was not finished, by the way. Uh, right, right. Yes? Mm-hmm. What was his purpose in writing these? That had 512 questions, it says, right? Page 137. Suggested by answers from Scripture, previous theologians, and reason. Followed by an in-depth critique of the answers, ending with his concluding answer and support for it. The Summa is still available in print and uh, actually has recently been going through a resurgence among white evangelicalism. White evangelicalism. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What was his angle? What what and and then think about Aristotle. How did that play into it? Yes. Okay. So his his MO was to convince people by reason of the validity of scripture. That was his approach. Provide a defense, an apologetic, as it were. Okay. So that's a noble thing to do. Right. So how did Aristotle's philosophy feed his methodology? What do we know? What, what did the author tell us about Arist Aristotelian, Aristotelian philosophy? Do you remember he designated or differentiated between Plato and Aristotle, universals, particulars? Do you remember that? Reading that? Where was that? That would have been on page... Uh, uh, let's see. 35? 135? Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right in the front. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, take a minute, refresh your thinking. What's in play here between these two approaches to knowledge, reasoning, understanding? Authority. Yes, uh, authority for sure. Okay, Revelation is in play, yes. That's right. So, well, let's just, let's just read it. If any philosopher affected Christianity, and it did, it was Platonism, as we have seen. This philosophy seemed to, quote, fit 
close quote, with Christianity due to its emphasis on universals, or in theological terms, the spiritual realm and reality. Now, remember, we talked about that, that the spiritual realm is the, is the real realm. Remember, origin, wanting to get to, the, you know, through his, his, um, his, what is the word we're looking for? His allegorical, allegorical approach, thank you. He wanted to get to the real deep and hidden meaning, okay? So, however, in the Middle Ages, that began to change. Aristotle, Plato's student, okay, Plato's student, and his philosophy had largely been rejected and forgotten in the Christian West due to Aristotle's emphasis on particulars of the natural realm. However, Australia... uh, Aristotelian philosophy did flourish in the East, especially in Islam, and it was followed through Islamic philosophers that reintroduced it into the West, specifically Spain, which the Muslims had conquered and occupied. We'll get to that later. Scholastic theology at this time focused on the integration of theology, revelation, and philosophy reason, so it stands to reason, no pun intended, that the thought of Aristotle would attract attention. Okay. So, the particulars dealing in the natural realm. The natural realm is the realm of reason. And so, their attempt to form what is called a natural theology. Proofs for the existence of God through reason. These were some of of, uh, Aquinas' most enduring legacy for us. Some of you are probably familiar with them. You may not have known where they came from. Probably the most well-known is the cosmological argument. The cosmological argument for the existence of God. The cosmological argument goes something like this, that uh, something cannot come from nothing. right? And the universe must have come from an uncaused cause. That's, the cause, that's the, essentially the cosmological argument for the existence of God. It uh, shows up today in our day and age in the in the realm of. Uh, um, I need more coffee. It shows up today <laughs> uh, in the realm of intelligent design. You're familiar with the concept of intelligent design, right? The universe, the world, displays design and intelligence behind it. That kind of speaks out of. The, the reality that there has got to be something behind that. Okay, intelligent design exa- uh, comes actually from the teleological argument, not the cosmological, but it's still it all runs in that same philosophical trough. You find these kinds of arguments persuasive? Yeah, you do. I mean, I find them persuasive because I'm a Christian. And so my, my initial presupposition is that God, that God is and he has revealed himself in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so therefore, I can see the truth in these arguments. Do they persuade unbelievers? Do they, do they, do they lead them to a saving knowledge? They cannot, yes. And see, this gets to the weakness of, of Aquinas' theology. So... Aquinas and those that have followed from him have operated in a realm of natural theology, f- forming these theological or philosophical arguments like teleological, cosmological, and so forth, and with the basic idea that if you can present a, a strong, airtight philosophical case for the existence of God, then the unbeliever will yield. To that, they will yield to that. So, what's wrong with that way of thinking? Okay, that's right. So, in Romans chapter one, so here's there's a couple of fatal flaws in this approach. Okay, and these these stand behind with these classical proofs for the existence of God, which. R.C. Sproul was a big believer in and propagator of, and before him, John Gershner. 
So this is, this is called classical apologetics. The problem becomes is let's just say, thought experiment with me, let's just, let's just say that the cosmological argument is philosophically airtight and that, a, and that a person will yield before that and say, okay, I agree. Nothing comes, you know, something doesn't come from nothing. The universe is something. There must be the uncaused cause behind it. You call him God. Okay, he's God. I, I accept your God. Intelligent design argument. I look around the universe, or I look around the, the, the earth, the universe, myself, you know, inward, outward, telescope, microscope. I see this irreducible complexity, and it's clear that it could not have just spontaneously developed. So there's got to be an intelligent designer behind this. Systems, all of that sorts of things. Double, you know, the double helix DNA, all of that. That can't, that can't just come happenstance. So I yield to your intelligent designer. What's the problem? Yeah. Well, they will. Yes. There's no attachment to Christ. There's no attachment to Christ. You, you, right. It, it provides a strengthening of our faith. Yes, for sure. For sure. And that is the problem is, is that it, it takes a person along and let's, do, let's just, I mean, work with me, thought experiment that, you know, they're, they're a, um, an honest truth seeker. Okay. I, I know what Romans one says <laughs> and what Romans says about, about the general revelation is that it leaves men condemned. Because that is the problem with all of those. It, it, it takes them to a God, not a Savior. It still leaves them in control of the battlefield. Because what is our problem? Our problem is, was, is that we are in rebellion against our Creator. And so, unless and until we acknowledge that reality and repent... And, and submit ourselves to the Lordship of Christ, recognizing what he has done on our behalf, then and only then can we be rightly related to God. So to use it evangelistically doesn't accomplish what needs to be done. Because even if you get him that far, so he goes from an atheist to a theist. You see, he's still retains his own autonomy. He decided his terms of his theism. He's, he's defining God however he's defining him in his mind. Okay, he's a, the unmoved mover, you know, the, so forth, the uncaused cause. He's the intelligent designer. He's the whatever. But that's insufficient. It's insufficient. Yes, because of Romans 1 where Paul says that um, the wrath of God is revealed, verse 18, from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they came futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures and so forth. So Paul tells us that, the un that all of humanity knows the one true God because they are made in the image of him. The law is written in their hearts. It's unavoidable. But in the, uh, the idea that's being communicated here is, the, is like holding a beach ball under the water in a swimming pool. They're suppressing it. It's an active suppression. You stick a beach ball and you hold it under the water. If you let go for a second, it pops to the surface. And that's what would happen with every one of us before Christ, which is if we weren't actively suppressing what we knew about him, it would pop to the surface again, which is why atheists are always arguing about God. I was an atheist. 
and spent a lot of time arguing with and about the God that I didn't believe existed. Right? That was my profession of my mouth. He doesn't exist, and yet I, I spent a ton of time trying to prove that. Because here in Romans 1, there's not salvific information either. General revelation doesn't provide specific information to save. Only to condemn. Say again? Yes. That's Paul's whole point. All stand under judgment of God because enough of God has been revealed externally in the heavens, internally in the conscience, and and the, and the fact that we are made in his image to condemn us, not to save us. And that's the problem with a, with a, um, a natural theology the same way. It does not provide the content to save. Yes, right. They, they're like wiz- the Wizard of Oz, you know, the guy standing behind the curtain. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right, so time is their, their curtain <laughs> that they hide behind, but yes. Okay, so these are, this is the problem with this natural theology. So are the arguments useful slash helpful? I would say yes. I would say yes. If we, and if this was an apologetics class, we would be teaching them to you. It's not useful in the sense that it, it's, it's incomplete. And if it's, if it's followed, it leads you to a dead end. You've, you've, got to, you've got to take somebody to the place where the very thing that you were unwilling to release, which is your independence, you and Eve both, and Adam. <laughs> nope is the very thing you had to repent of. So my approach is, I don't want to waste a bunch of time dealing with all these philosophical arguments. Let's just get to the real issue. And there, and there are ways to do that, for sure. So I'm not a fetist. I don't just say, well, you got to believe because you got to believe because you got to believe. Right? Benny Bible banger. Just going to slap you the side of the head with the Bible and, you know, believe. You're going to want to use Catholic Bible banger. <laughs> Yeah, right? So uh, we, uh, God has made us reasonable, rational beings, and so yes, the intellect is involved for sure. But what has to be surrendered is the independent use of that intellect. And that's the weakness in this philosophical approach is it leaves the person in command of the battlefield. So they have not been vanquished. They must be vanquished. And so apologetically, if I'm dealing with somebody, I just want to go right to the heart of the mission, you know, the issue here. Let's, let's vanquish your autonomy. And so there are ways to do that and to draw that out, to point out to them the self-contradictory nature of their assumed autonomy, that it's bankrupt. They don't know what they think they know. So that kind of an approach. So your conversion testimony is actually remarkably similar to mine. I also came to a place that I believed God was. Sin was real. God had sent his son to die in the place of sinners. Sinners go to hell, rightly and justly. Those that believe in, in Jesus are saved and go to heaven. I, I had come to a place where I believed all of that, and guess what? I was dead in a doornail on my way to hell. Until God broke me over, well, I'll just tell you, over a theft, over something I stole. Because in that moment, what happened was my entire um, persona that I had created, that I was a good person, was destroyed. What I knew now was I was a thief. And, and I knew where thieves rightly went and that left me that was like a boxing motif the boxer had cut the cut the ring and pushed me into the corner there was no way to get away and delivered the knockout punch well i came to be through the reading of the bible someone read the bible with me answered questions all of those things yes that's how i came to believe okay so the, so without getting too lost in this there is um 
There is notitia, which is the knowledge of God. There is essentia, that is the, the agreement with the knowledge of God. And then there's fiducia, that is, that is the belief in the knowledge of God that you know. And Roman Catholic theology built on Aquinas leaves people at essentia, which is they agree to this, but it's still outside of them. They have yet to repent and trust wholeheartedly in the grace of God in the person of Christ. And that's what it requires. Let's move on. We can talk more. Okay? All right. So let's see. What else do we have uh, about Aquinas? Something positive about Aquinas? Yeah, give me something positive. He did state and stand on the, the idea that the grace of God was a monergistic work. Yes, he did. Yes. Yep. So what was his fatal flaw there, though? It's right there on page 140. It's the lead-in sentence to the second paragraph. Yes, they were, they were monogistic, but he equated them. Do you see that statement? He equated them, which makes them then both a process that remains unfulfilled through this life and for, into purgatory for the next. <laughs> where, where you? Yep, page 140, second paragraph. Aquinas equated justification and sanctification. The, the former is more outward in relationship to God's holiness. The latter is more inward in relation to personal holiness, but they are inseparable and both are incomplete until the end of life. Protestants have protested. <laughs> they charge that this leads to works righteousness, and at least partially that is, that we must contribute to our own salvation by living a holy life, sanctification. And he goes on to say, and he's a very generous writer, by the way, Aquinas probably does open himself to such a charge. Okay. That it's the work of God. Salvation is the work of God alone. So he's not Pelagian. Mm -hmm. By grace. By grace. So in a, in a developed Roman Catholic system, and we're going to get to Roman Catholicism pretty soon here, next section in the syllabus, is that um, salvation is a process in Roman Catholicism. Okay, it's a, it's a grace-driven process, theologically. Now, what happens practically is the grace gets kind of side, put to the side and it becomes more about self-effort in many cases. Okay? All right. Uh, let's see. While we're finishing it here, we might as well finish with this. Um, bottom of page 140, Aquinas also made rather definitive statements regarding some uniquely Roman Catholic doctrines, such as the following. The Immaculate Conception of Mary. She's born without original sin. The church as the mediator of, sal of salvation. Christ's death provides salvation, but the church distributes that salvation primarily through the sacraments. Third, the seven sacraments of the church, in addition to baptism and the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, include penance, ordination, marriage, confirmation, and last rites, or extreme unction. Okay, that deals with any sin that's hanging on there at the end. Transubstantiation, which we will get to, and Platonic Aristotelian philosophy is what supports it. Okay, the idea that it becomes the actual body and blood of Christ, yet remains uh, what's, what they talk about is in, its, in its particulars, it's still bread and wine, but in its universals, it becomes the actual body and blood of Christ. Okay, that's what supports transubstantiation. It's a Thomistic idea, philosophically built. Uh, and then purgatory. So those are all doctrines to which uh, Thomas contributed. Yes. Um, they, are, they, are, um, they are growing. So they are not all official 
Roman Catholic doctrine by this point, and and I'm I'm trying to remember the Immaculate Conception of Mary. I think is in the 18. I, I think I've got it written in your syllabus. It's in the 1800s, I believe. So some of it, it took quite a while for it to become official church dogma, even though it might have been widely believed before that. Right. Yep. In support. Yeah. Second Maccabees in support of, uh, is it second or first? I don't remember. Maccabees in support of transubstantiation. Yep. Mm -hmm. Or purgatory, rather. Yeah. Purgatory. Yep. Okay. All right. Good. Anything else that we want to note about him? You said you probably don't think you're going to be seeing him again. Uh, uh, that would be the only, yeah. I mean, if he's got the right Jesus, just, I'm just not sure. I mean, I'm, and I'm not, I have not read Aquinas, you know, poquito. So I'm far from a scholar. So there's just a lot of things that I go, oh man, ooh, ah, ooh. <laughs> don't know. Again, one of those guys I wouldn't want to be handcuffed to in the rapture. So, okay. Some of you get that? All right. Okay, well, let's move on then to uh, another one. This one will light your fire. If you like Thomas, you'll love Julian, whoever she was. Yep. Yes? Yes. Okay, again, in all fairness, let's begin with what we can find that might be commendable and uh, without necessarily focusing on just poor Julian, whoever this poor woman was. Okay, So Julian is, is chosen here as a representative of something that's much bigger than that. So what are we talking about? <laughs> right. Yeah, what's the what's the positive behind Christian mysticism? Because that's what we're talking about, Christian mystics. Yep. Yep. So you're asking me to opine on that, or, or maybe I should say, what do you think about that statement? Uh, yeah, I do. I do. You should apply it to your life. Well. And understand what's being said. Yes, and so that's. That's why I think there is truth in his the author's statement here, and and will when we get to the nineteenth century, late well eighteenth century, seventeen hundreds, what we will see is that across European Protestant theology, their theology had hardened, so it was technically correct, but it had not penetrated to their heart. And that gave birth to pietism, which was born out of in Germany and spread uh, in in some ways for the betterment of the church. The ditch is on either side of the way. There are ditches. Because no theology, all theology, no relationship. Yes. When theology gets reduced to a doctrinal position, a uh, uh, catechism, uh, a doctrinal statement, a series of propositions, and faithfulness is measured on, do you believe all of these things, and can you explain them rightly? If that becomes the measure of spirituality, then yes, we fall into the ditch where we have forgotten what that theology is supposed to do. It is to, it is to thaw our hard hearts. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, it hasn't gotten from the head to the heart. So, which is just something that all of us should be aware there is that ditch, that we could fall into it. Right. But just think about the way the New Testament epistles are put together. First half, doctrine. What you should, what you must believe. Second half, how you must live. Doctrine always leads to duty. And if it doesn't, yes, there's been a disconnect. Sure. Yes, it's got to be love and truth. Without truth, it's not love. 
there are these ditches. So is there anything in mysticism? I mean, is it a, the approach I think is easy enough to criticize. Is there anything in their instinct that you would go, oh, there's something commendable in this. I mean, what were they seeking? Yes. So where did they seek to know him from? Okay, page 144, third paragraph. Okay, so again, not to, certainly not commending Christian mysticism to you, but trying to be fair. The activities associated with Christian mysticism were many and varied, certainly the study of Scripture, but also prayer, meditation, and asceticism in many forms. These were all intended to purify one of sin and draw one toward God in order to be one with him. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, again, looking at, at some of these uh, Christian disciplines that they practiced in ways that many whose doctrine is very to put together don't. Don't spend significant amount of time praying. Say again? Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. And mysticism exists and flourishes in paganism. So, absolutely. Could be some Gnostic Gnosticism behind some of it, yeah. Right, immediate, immediate contact, yep, yep. Sure, that sounds charismatic to me, yeah. Mm -hmm. When we get to the charismatics, you know, later in your syllabus, again, we're going to try to find some things about the charismatic movement that are, you go, okay, went too far, you know, whatever, but is there anything here, or are we just, like, completely writing everything off? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, let's see, was there anything else with regard to this? Somewhere here he listed hymn writers that were had mystic tendencies. Where did we see that? Do you guys remember that? Come on. Don't tell me no. Did I write it down? Or did I read it somewhere else? Maybe I read it somewhere else. Hold on. Well, I must have read it somewhere else and I didn't write it down. Sorry. But it's it's Francis of Assisi and... Thank you. Oh, yeah, here we go. Thank you. Yeah, there it is. So, early mystical theology, middle of the paragraph, can be found in some of the thinkers we've already considered. For example, Augustine, Anselm, Aquinas, many others. Bernard of Clairvaux, Francis of Assisi, Bonaventure, Thomas of Kempis, The Imitation of Christ, that book, not a favorite of mine, but it certainly recycles through the church periodically. Okay, that's the What Would Jesus Do movement, Thomas of Kempis. I mean, that's the modern version of that. So... Again, are we going to see some of these people in heaven with us? I think for sure we will. I think for sure we will. Yes. Yeah. That's tough to stomach, isn't it? Yeah, that's tough to stomach. Sounds like she might have wrong Jesus. Why don't you read that, Would you like me to read that one? Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Yep. Now, again, I want to remind you all, the 40 most influential Christians who shaped what we believe today and from his introduction, okay, just so we don't forget, where is it here now? Well, I should have looked ahead of time, but I'll just summarize it for you. What he's basically saying is they're influential, not always in a good way. Not always in a good way. Okay. But they are influential. Yep. I would imagine their theology is probably already correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Was it? Yep. Yep. Okay. So I chose this book for you because I don't want to just give you a church history and have you read it. I mean, you could do that, and I would recommend reading those kinds of things. But I wanted to stir the pot with you a little bit and introduce you to a far broader uh, sampling than I could bring you just in the syllabus itself. So, yeah. So I'm not a big friend of, uh, of poor Julian. Again, whoever she was. But let's now go on to the good Dr. Luther. He's a character. Okay, and again, let's, um, let's not dress him up in uh, funny red tights with a big S on his chest. Okay, Dr. Luther was used of God in mighty ways, but he put his pants on just like you, one leg at a time. So, biographically, what do we know about Poor Martin. What do we know? He say what? Born to a successful businessman. Yep. What did his father want him to be? Wanted him to be a lawyer. Why? Because it's an honorable profession. Yeah, he made good money as lawyers. Okay. So, as an obedient son to his father, he went off to law school, but he had a fatal flaw. Not fatal, but well, what was his problem? He was scared of thunder. <laughs> and behind the thunder, he was terrified of whom? God. Why was he terrified of God? He knew he was a sinner, and he knew God was a just God, fully holy, a just God filled with wrath, yes. And so in poor Luther's mind with his legal training, he is in trouble. He's got no defense. No defense. So yes, in a thunderstorm, he was, you know, knocked off his horse and, and called out to, I think it was St. Anne, to save him <laughs> and vowed that he would become a monk. Why? Why become a monk? Because it was the it was the the occupation that he could m most um, perfectly try to fulfill the law of God and get out from under his legal troubles in a workspace system. And was Luther good at a workspace system? Other than the Apostle Paul, there's probably been no one better. He would go to confession and spend hours confessing sin and receiving, you know, absolution. He would, he would walk out of the confessional, begin to walk down the hall of the cloister, turn around and walk back and say, uh, there's, there's more. I got more. All right, so that podcast, if you're, if you're seriously interested in, in uh, Martin Luther, then I can recommend a biography for you which is called Here I Stand. It is written by Roland Bainton, B-A-I-T-O-N. He's a Lutheran historian. He's dead now, but it is a magisterial biography of Martin Luther. So it's, it's a good read. It's, a, it's not a hard read. It's a good read. Yes, this is a very troubled man. Very troubled man. He went to Rome. Why? Oh, yeah, exactly. And he got to Rome, and he was discouraged. Why was he discouraged in Rome? Yes, the debauchery all around him. So yes, he's, he's only more troubled. I mean, again, he's a legal mind, and he is guilty, and he knows he's guilty. He proceeds on, graduates, begins in the ministry as a priest, goes to offer his first communion, and he is so terrified, he can't do it. He turns and, and runs away. He, he, he can't bring himself to handle Christ, which is what he thought. He was just too terrified of it. Okay. 
modern psychologists or, or so forth diagnosing Luther, they'd say this man is, you know, belongs locked up. <laughs> okay. But what, what happened? What set him free? Okay. The book of Romans set him free. Yes. Romans 1.17 set him free. The just shall live by faith. It set him free. Yes. Yes, it did. It said it right in the book. Yes. Yep. Yes. Very good. Very good. Thank you. When we get in our syllabus and we talk about monasticism, um, I'm going to point out the providential benefits of monasticism to the preserving of texts and the restudy of texts. But yes, when he looked at it in its context, he was set free. So, okay. So, and he doesn't get into the rest of the bi biographical stuff, um, but don't worry, I will. Uh, I'm just, I'm absolutely fascinated um, by this man. He, he, is a, he is a man of complexities, for sure, and contradictions. <laughs> so, what else, um, what, can we, what can we take away in terms of the good? He translated the Bible and in the process created the German language. Modern German language was created in large degree by Luther, just like an MAF, or not MAF, a um, uh, New Tribes Ministry missionary creates a language into a culture into which they go. Yep. But through the translation of the Bible. Go ahead. Yep. Yep. You have an appendix in your syllabus that gives you the, the uh, family trees of the Bible translations, and you can see the impact of Luther's translation. Yep. It's good. Very good. Well, you know what? We're, we're going to be spending plenty of time on Luther, so I don't want to get lost any longer here. I would just say, I would just commend this one other thing to you. If you're interested in the biography, here I stand. Uh, it's an easy read. If you're interested in something that's theologically a lot denser, then I would recommend to you um, the bondage of the will. Okay, the bondage of the will is is Luther's defense of of depravity, essentially, and the need uh, for electing grace and the, and the work of salvation in that way. So it's a very good book. Okay, so the bondage of the will, and you get a flavor when you read it of Luther's personality which will end here on page 156. He was rather caustic, belligerent, arrogant, and tactless with those who disagreed with him uh, to, to pretty much any degree, both Catholic and fellow Protestants. Yep. Read the bondage of the will in his dispute with Erastus and where he calls him, you stupid idiot, or ask, you know, and that's kind of, that was his opening approach. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, so we're going three more chapters for next week, right? So we are looking at 22, 23, 24, so we get to look at, at Zwingli, right? Well, we're Zwingli, and so, yeah, he loved the Credo Baptist so much that he personally supervised their drownings. His own students his own students. Okay. Will I see him in heaven? I think so. But here's going to be the interesting part. They're, he's there and so are those that he drowned. <laughs> so are those that he drowned. We'll pick up Mr. Calvin, another trained legal mind, and then ah, Menno Simons. We'll pick up him too. Okay. The radical reformer. So, we are, we are in your book. You are moving into the Reformation period, of course. We're on page 15 in your syllabus. Chalcedon, 451. That would be a really good date to have on a timeline of 100 important events from church history. Just a word to the wise. Okay. Chalcedon in 451 would be a good one to commit to memory, along with Nicaea in 325. Another good date to have on a timeline. All right, here we go. So, at the Council of Nicaea,
The truth about the deity of Christ had been preserved, but the question of how did his deity and his humanity relate to each other had yet to be resolved. Right? So we're now 130 something years has passed. Questions such as was Christ two persons or one? Were his natures independent of each other or were they mixed? Generated different answers depending on who was consulted. In addition, the church had grown in political power in the last century, having been gone from the persecuted minority now to the political majority. You remember Theodosius in 381 declared Christianity the only legal and lawful religion of the Roman Empire. Another good date to have on a list of 100 names, or 100 dates, by the way. Okay. So they had grown in political power in the last century, and now various cities were vying with each other for influence within the church. Four key cities had risen to prominence and had formed an east-west coalition against each other in their bid for dominance within the church. In the west were Rome and Alexandria in Egypt. In the east were Constantinople in Turkey and Antioch in Syria. The archbishops of these cities were called patriarchs, and they wielded considerable influence and power among the people. The Council of Chalcedon, the patriarch of Rome, Leo I, rose to to preeminence even among his peers and thus helped to pave the way for the later idea of the papacy. The council was called by the emperor at the request of Leo I for the purpose of resolving the rupture in Christendom. Again, the idea that Christendom, the, the church at large, it was still only, you know, there weren't, that wasn't First Baptist, Second Baptist, Third Baptist, right? Whenever there's a First Baptist, there's always a Second Baptist, and it doesn't take long to come about. Um, and that just has to do with the way Baptists operate. But there was only one church, okay? There was only one church. So here are the positions represented there. The monophysite view Mono, one physis, nature, one nature, also known as Eutychianism. Now, in your syllabus, I think if you turn the page, you will see on, uh, what page are you on? You are on 15? 16, yeah. Turn the page to 17, thank you. I'm working with an older copy than yours, but I think we're kind of paginated. Page 17, it is up there behind me as well. Yes, so you see Eutychianism denied the distinction of the natures. So this position taught that Christ in the incarnation had only one nature, the nature of God that became flesh and man. Thus God was born, God suffered, God was crucified, and God died. They said that Christ's nature was lost in the divine, and I love this, as a drop of honey which falls into the sea dissolves into it. Isn't that a beautiful way to talk about theology? Yeah, okay. So that's Eutychianism for you. The Nestorian view. This position taught that Christ had two persons, human and divine, in one body. This led to the view, this is an addition, I'm giving you some more information. This led to the view that Jesus accomplished salvation by being a godly person and and, uh, cooperating perfectly with the divine Logos who had assumed him. He thus becomes our model rather than our divine healer. Okay, so you can see Nestorianism over there in your chart. Two separate persons in Christ, two persons in one body, denied the union of the natures. Okay, so we would say in response to that, there's no evidence of a human divine talking to each other or struggling. Jesus doesn't refer to himself as we. He calls himself I. Okay. Then there is the orthodox view proposed by Leo I. He taught that Christ had two natures, human and divine, in one person. Christ was perfect in both of these natures, brought together by what is called the hypostatic union. These two natures in one person are, and here it is, without confusion or change. That is the rebuke of mono, the monophysite view. Division or separation, that is the rebuke of the Nestorian view. These four words, 
without confusion, change, division, or separation are what is known as the four fences of Chalcedon. Okay? These are called the four fences of Chalcedon, and they protect the mystery of the incarnation. We'll get to that a little bit more here in a minute. The results. The vast majority of the 400 bishops who attended attended, accepted Leo's view, and the emperor declared it to be law. That's the best way to do theology, by the way, is all you need is an emperor <laughs> to agree with you and declare it law, and if you don't agree, you're now a heretic and will be thrown in prison or banished or some other suitable punishment. Your tongue will be torn out. All the Eutychian bishops were banished and their books were burned. Okay, so that sort of ended them. Rome became the most important city religiously in the empire by force of personality of Leo I. Rome now rose to prominence. Okay, so you, maybe you're thinking, okay, how did, like, how did the Roman Catholic Church become preeminent? It's, this is how it happened. This is how it happened. Chalcedonian Orthodoxy, although not really describing, notice these words, not really describing how the two natures exist in one person, Established the theological fences beyond which it is not safe to go in speculating upon the incarnation of Christ. So, we're in 2023. This is 451. My math is um, challenged, but we're 1500, almost 1600 years later, and we haven't improved on it. We've not been able to improve on it. So, here is the Chalcedonian Creed reproduced for you. We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, of a reasonable or rational soul and body, consubstantial, that's the idea of the same nature, means of the same nature, or, or coessential with the Father, according to the Godhead, and consubstantial with us according to the manhood. So of the same nature as, as God the Father, and of the same nature as you and I. In all things like unto us, without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father, according to the Godhead, and in these latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, Theotokos, according to the manhood, and one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, and here it is, these are the defenses again, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. The distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, and only begotten, God of the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. There is your Chalcedonian creed. There are, uh, we are not a creedal church here, so we don't, recite the creeds, uh, but there are churches that do recite the Nicene Creed and the Chalcedonian Creed, so forth. Yes, yes. It doesn't explain it. They were not able to explain it. Guess what? We're not either. What they did was establish the boundaries of it <laughs> from Scripture and said, this is a mystery. This is what we know. This is what we can say with with the confidence from the scriptures, but beyond that, we don't know. So, can could we have a lively discussion about some of that? Oh, absolutely. Peccability and impeccability, that always raises a lively discussion within the fences of Chalcedon. Okay? Peca peccability, impeccability. Um, Christ, could he sin or could he not sin? Right? Peccable means that he could sin, not that he did. That's how... That's out of bounds. <laughs> but peccability says he could have. Impeccability said he could never have. Okay? And it's a discussion of what? It's a discussion of the relationship between the humanity and, and deity. Okay? So, 
We'll clean it up here with looking at these false views. So some of these are uh, older. So for example, in the upper left there, Ebenism, that's a first century Jewish Christian heresy. The focus on Christianity as a moral code and Jesus as a prophet like Moses, right? So they denied the divine nature. To the right, you see docetism. That denied the human nature. John in 1 John is very strong about rejecting docetism. We talked about it back in the syllabus when we were there. So Christ's humanity was only apparent according to the docetists. Okay? Why do they believe that? Because they were steeped in Platonic philosophy. Fourth century, Arianism. Fourth century means the years in the 300s. Okay? Arianism was uh, rebuked in the Council of Nicaea in 325. Great date for a timeline. Okay? Council of Nicaea, 325. Put, put a theological end to Arianism. It took a while for it to work its way through. So denied the divine nature, right? Modern day Ari- uh, Arians are those nice people that come to your door. Um, they're Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay? Nestorianism denied the union of the natures. That's a 5th century heresy. Eutychianism, another 5th century uh, heresy. That's the monophysite. So it denies the distinction of natures. That's the one where it's like honey being dissolved in the ocean. Right? So, so poetic and beautiful. And then we have Apollinarianism. That's an interesting one. So there, uh, Christ has no human spirit or mind, only a divine spirit and mind. And this was defeated in the 4th century at the Council of Constantinople in 381. All right? So, we would say that if Christ did not have a human mind, then he could not redeem our mind. And you've heard me say this before. Christ could not redeem what he did not assume. In other words, if he, if there was any part of our humanity that he himself did not experience, that he did not possess, that's a better way to say it, then he could not redeem it. So yes, Jesus the Christ, body, soul, spirit, just like you and I. Okay? We all good? Flip your page. The union of deity and humanity in the person of Christ. Uh, editorially, all diagrams are like analogies. They, they, if they're well done, they're useful, but they all fall short at some point. So you can't push it too far. But here it is. So there you see the person of the Son in both his divine nature and human nature, and he acts through either nature So you see localized learning and limited in his humanity, in his deity is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. Okay? Was the second person of the Trinity, was and is the second person of the Trinity omnipresent? What do you think? Yes is the correct answer. Yes is the correct answer. It says it right there. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. Okay? Now, that's the context is church discipline. That's what the two or three is about. It's the witnesses and so forth. Okay? So it's not about if we can get three at a prayer meeting, we know Jesus is here with us, a fourth. That's not what that's about. Okay. But yes, the second person of the Trinity never surrendered his deity. He could not. And the best analogy I can come up with, and if someone comes up with a better one, I'd love to hear it, is that when God the Father descended upon the tabernacle and took up residence in the Holy of Holies, did he surrender his omnipresence? And the answer is no. Right? Because omnipresence doesn't mean that God is diffused through the universe. What it means is that God is everywhere in the entirety of his personage simultaneously. Okay? 
And if that does not blow your mind, you need another drink of coffee. You need another cup of coffee. Okay? So he is not diffused. There's not a little bit of him floating around. He is there in the entirety of his personage with all his attributes simultaneously everywhere and has been and always will be. Even in hell. God is in hell. Okay. Tormenting, <laughs> justly, those there confined. Okay. So that's Chalcedon. We now have definitions of orthodoxy. When we come back next week, we move on to, to the third section, which we've entitled as Darkness and Withdrawal. Darkness and Withdrawal, 590 to 1517. Okay? And we will look at Islam, we will look at monasticism, and we will look at Roman Catholicism. Darkness and Withdrawal. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.